There is nothing that can be done to stop dramatic sea level rises. That's the warning from scientists studying the melting Greenland ice sheet. Last year was record-breaking for natural disasters. So what does this all mean for attempts to deal with climate change? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. Major sea level rises are now inevitable, even if we stop burning fossil fuels today. That is the assessment of scientists studying the Greenland ice sheet in the Arctic. Its glaciers are melting much faster than predicted. Researchers say the best case scenario is a rise of 27 centimetres, but global sea levels could go up by 78. And this is likely to happen by the end of the century. Ocean scientist David Holland says this means natural disasters that are already more frequent will become more destructive. It's particularly uh, associated with uh, extreme events like storms and king tides. If you have a background sea level rising of about a foot, and then you have a large tide, and then you have a storm, well, then you have something like Hurricane Sandy that we went through in New York. So I believe that will become a more frequent occurrence around the planet. We're raising the background, and thus we're actually making nat other natural events more severe. This is, if you will, a baked in or committed fact. Um, the carbon dioxide in the air around us now is going to be here a long time. And so the warming is committed, and the reorganization of the ice sheet of Greenland um, is, is already there. We um, should be perhaps more concerned with what's possibly going to happen in the south, in Antarctica. There the stakes are enormous. We're talking about uh, a change that could be many meters. Well, a major concern for climate scientists is the global temperature increase. In 2015, of course, world leaders struck a deal in Paris agreeing to limit warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. But UN experts say even this level could reshape coastlines and affect 1.3 billion people. Here's how. Warmer oceans will begin to melt ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. The meltwater flows into the sea, causing levels to rise. New York City is prone to flooding. 1.6 million people could be affected. Mumbai has twice its population. Its people face threats of monsoons fueled by a warming Indian Ocean. London relies on the Thames barrier to protect it from flooding. But climate change could pose a greater risk of storm surges. And Africa's biggest city, Lagos, is vulnerable to rising sea levels, and that is a risk for 2.2 million people. It's not only rising oceans that are creating chaos. The UN says last year saw record-breaking disasters. They included wildfires, heat waves, floods and droughts. Many could have been avoided or had their impacts reduced, according to a new report. During 2021 and 22, disasters took the lives of about 10,000 people and cost more than $280 billion in damage worldwide. The UN has been looking at how the effects of extreme weather events can be reduced. It studied 10 emergencies from earthquakes to droughts, floods and wildfires, and it said the causes of disasters need to be identified, such as erosion that can lead to landslides as seen in Haiti and sandstorms in Madagascar. And the report suggests better warning systems could have reduced deaths during a heat wave in Canada and flooding in Lagos in Nigeria. It says there needs to be more focus on designing and implementing sustainable solutions. All right, let's bring in our guests. In Evanston in Illinois is Yarrow Axford, a climate scientist and associate professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Northwestern University. Yarrow focuses on Greenland's climate history. Uh, in Bonn is Zita Zebesvari, lead author of the Interconnected Disaster Risks Report we were just talking about, and deputy director of the UN University's Institute for Environment and Human Security. And in Newcastle is Sharon George, a senior lecturer in environment and sustainability at Keele University in the UK. Uh, Sharon specializes on the development of low carbon technology. Welcome to you all, great to have you here with us. Plenty to go at, of course. Let's start with this troubling news from Greenland. Yara Axford, you know all too well what's happening with the Greenland ice sheet. Tell us what this research means in layman's terms. Climate scientists have known for a long time and been concerned for a long time that the 
ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are so huge and so complex that they kind of can't keep up with the pace of climate change that humans have caused in, in recent decades. And so there's a sort of lag in ice sheet response to human caused warming, a bit like if you put, uh, you, you take ice cubes out of the freezer and put them on the kitchen counter in a warm room, they don't melt immediately, but you know that those ice cubes are doomed if you leave them sitting out in that new climate that you've forced on them. Um, portions of our ice sheets are doomed in that same way, but um, one of the really big uncertainties in climate science has long been and still is sort of how much and how fast the ice sheets will respond to climate change. So this study uh, takes one bite out of that problem by trying to quantify that committed loss of ice um, for the first time, as far as I know. Right, and, and the, the point is here uh, that even if we ended carbon emissions now, this, this sea level rise is locked in. That's right, so the study um, tries to quantify that kind of best case scenario where if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, and stabilize climate where it is today, how much ice would we still lose in the future with no continued additional warming? And the numbers are, are pretty devastating. It really shines a light on how much damage we've already done to the climate system. The study finds that um, we've sort of baked in or committed to the loss of about 3% of the Greenland ice sheet. That's 110 trillion metric tons of ice. Uh, if I've done my math right, that's about 14,000 metric tons for every person on Earth. Right. And 3% of the Greenland ice sheet, that equates to, and this is the best case scenario, Zita Zebesvari, that equates to 27 centimetres of sea level rise, which does not sound much, but even those impacts could be devastating. That's right, isn't it? Yes, so I think uh, if we are looking into the low-lying coast and um, and into planning processes, so how do we uh, protect uh, populations, but also uh, ecosystem? How do we reduce the risk? Then we need to consider different uh, levels of sea level rise in our planning process. So the best case scenario, that's the minimum, and uh, this is something we can plan with for sure. But we also need to consider the high-end scenarios because whenever you are planning with critical infrastructure such as hospitals, harbors, but also large cities like, like New York or Lagos in, uh, in Nigeria, you really need to also know what could be the worst scenario and uh, how to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And um, many times when you, when you hear these um, uh, calculations, how many people will be affected, that's oftentimes done without considering our reactions. Um, but our reactions and our uh, disaster risk reduction measures are as much important as uh, mean global sea level rise is in order to, to deal with the issue. So there's a lot we can do as a society and um, uh, we also have to do because uh, uh, there is a commitment to sea level rise. Part of it we can't change, but we also need to prepare for right. even worse. And we'll scenarios. come on to that. We'll come on to that shortly. Uh, but Sharon, first of all, when we consider the, the highest scenario, uh, what we have to remember is all we're talking about here at the moment is the Arctic. But if you factor in what could happen and is happening in Antarctica and the collapse of ice sheets there, uh, then you have a real problem. Yeah, because that, that, that effect is rippling out. So when we talk about all oh, this is impacting sea level, we've got to think that, you know, one in 10 of us live in a low level, around the globe, live in a low lying area. Um, you know, most two thirds of our largest cities are in low lying areas. So this is impacting not only through flooding. So, you know, think about you've already got a raised sea level and then, that, that, you know, if you get a storm surge in, that damage is worse. But you're impacting people's livelihoods around those low-lying areas. So it, it, with what we're seeing are challenges around farmland that's being, it, it's becoming saline. We're having problems where um, people are just struggling to stay where they are. So this is driving indirect impacts like human migration and then couple that with the challenges that climate change are bringing in our ability to produce food then we've, we've seen this on this awful situation unfolding before our eyes and sharon when you talk about human migration it's not the kind of migration necessarily that we're seeing 
right now across borders. We're talking about human migration within nations, aren't you, away from the coastline? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're talking about movement of people where away from where they've lived, they've worked, they've had a livelihood and they've been able to support themselves and their families. And when that becomes uneconomical, what we're seeing is a huge you know, swathes of the population, like for, for instance, you know, areas of Bangladesh, people will migrate to the mega city that's already at capacity. And, and that, that's, a, you know, a double whammy there because that city is under pressure from flooding. So, you know, we've got, we, we have these impacts where people are, are you're know, being forced to move when we haven't got that infrastructure to support them under situations where, that even just to exist without this migration because of climate change is more difficult already. So there's there's a whole range of pressures on on the, the population globally. Right. And and this is going to change significantly. Now, Yarrow Axford, there's no precise timeline here, but what would the report's authors I think are talking about is that this kind of effect the best case scenario of 27 centimetre rise from Greenland alone will happen, is likely to happen this century. And that really is not far away, is it? That seems to be the author's best guess about timeline, mm -hmm. but that's not something that's rigorously evaluated in this particular right. study, which, which distinguishes it from some other work. You know, the, the IPCC reports um, most recently in 2021 have projected something like a uh, half a meter to a meter of sea level rise within the coming century. Um, that's a larger number because it uh, includes contributions from Antarctica, which you just mentioned, and from the many smaller glaciers that are scattered around the planet, as well as warming of ocean water, which expands it and contributes to sea level rise. So that's why it's a, a larger number. This century is is here now, you yeah, know, exactly. I, it's, it's, my it's, son will live to experience a lot of this, yeah, what we're talking about today. It's a clear and present danger, isn't it? The thing is that I was going to ask about the IPCC and, and the, the difference in these figures, because it's, it's, this is an issue, isn't it? It's hard for the public to take in and one moment they'll hear it's bad news and the next moment they'll hear it's worse. Uh, you know, how, how does the layman get a grip, Yarrow, on, on what's going on and, and to be aware and, and to be concerned about what's happening? Because actually, it's so confusing that people just don't register. Yeah, that's that's a fair response. Um, between the way that science works and the way we are constantly refining things and looking at things from different angles and the way that, that these complex um, pieces of science are then reported in the news media, it does feel like a lot of back and forth and, and waffling about what's going on. But um, I, the reality is that we have known for a very long time that a warming world will be a world with rising sea levels and with a lot of loss of ice from the ice sheets. And perhaps the most important thing for people to understand is that every impact of climate change, whether it's physical ice loss from an ice sheet, or we're talking about impacts on humans or ecosystems, scales with the amount of warming. So we can quibble about you know, scientists can quibble about exactly how much loss of ice we're already committed to. And I think that's an important question to try to tackle. But the really important thing to keep in mind is that the more the planet warms, the bigger these impacts are going to be. So Zeta, coming on to the UN report, clearly doing nothing is not an option. There's already this ongoing list of climate disasters. Uh, you know, we're seeing right now the Pakistan floods is, is a key case in point. But we can mitigate these disasters as laid out in your report. So just tell us a little bit about that and what, what the potential solutions are. So most importantly, we say that there are no natural disasters uh, because uh, uh, there are natural hazards. And for example, sea level rise is driving those uh, natural hazards like flooding, coastal flooding, inundation, erosion, salinization. But um, there's a huge influence of human action, our planning processes, our decisions. How do we plan along the coast and how do we protect our coastline? And this is um, why it's really important that these global sea level rise projections are translated into uh, local uh, sea level rise projections and local planning. 
Um, the reason behind is that there is a global sea level rise, but uh, that doesn't mean that sea level rise plays out in the very same way uh, locally. For example, in Lagos, Nigeria, which we have one of the cases, land is sinking. Uh, that means that local sea level rise is actually much higher because it combines the sinking land, combines with the rising sea. And then uh, locally, you need to know uh, um, what you need to plan for. And then uh, you need to factor in what, what I already mentioned. Is it a critical infrastructure I am planning to, to build? Or uh, uh, can I retreat? Or can I... Uh, uh, advanced, that means build into, into the sea, uh, like uh, sediment-based measures to protect the shoreline. All right. And, uh, this so so there's, there's lots sorry. of, forgive me for jumping in, but there's so much ground to cover, but there are solutions, but the bottom line is they cost an awful lot of money and, and most of the countries that are most vulnerable do not have that kind of money. It needs to come from the wealthy nations. And as we've seen countless UN climate summits, that money just isn't forthcoming. So. Where does the money come from and how do we get resolution? The cost of inaction is much higher for everyone um, uh, than the cost of action now. So this is what uh, we are communicating uh, since, since at least 20 years, that investing now will really pay off. And um, there is the 100 billion pledge uh, of uh, developed nations towards developing countries who are feeling the impacts of uh, uh, climate change. Um, developed, uh, developing, uh, developed countries did not uh, yet deliver on that promise um, that was made in, in 2010 in Copenhagen. So that needs to be fulfilled and then we need to step up uh, with ambition also in terms of uh, climate finance and uh, finance for adaptation. And Sharon, uh, low carbon technology, it, it's a remit of part of your remit, I know. Uh, it's, it's part of the answer to it all. How are we doing on the the march of the future, the march of the, the brave new world that we need to be in? Oh, there's some great technology out there. I'm like, really excited I'm working on hydrogen at the moment through my Hydex project, which is which is great and it shows promise and it, it gives an alternative to natural gas. Um, however, it's not these sorts of technologies not happening anywhere near at the pace that we need them to. And again, it comes down to money and, and having that investment and that vision and, and just the, the pace of change that we need just clearly isn't there at the moment. And in the meantime, we're, we're seeing these impacts that are costing money. So the money's being spent in the wrong place. And, you know, if we could wind the clock back, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, but we are where we are. And I think governments need to now start really investing in and in, 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 in speeding up, moving away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible, but also putting technology in that doesn't just you know, mitigate against um, carbon, but we need to be removing carbon if we stand any chance of keeping below those thresholds. I mean, we talk about a three degree threshold. We're not far off. You know, we've got papers out there that, that talk about five degrees of mass extinction um, level that we've seen kind of in the past. We are scarily quite close to the edge and this isn't a risk that the planet can afford to take. So that investment needs to be paid by by the globe, by by everybody. And, and the wealthier nations are those nations that are producing the most emissions and need to be investing in that technology to move us into a safer place. Yes, the speed of change is a terrifying thing, isn't it? Uh, uh, Yarrow, in, in your studies of, of Greenland, in, in the time that you have been studying, have you been surprised about the rate of change? Yeah, um, from the time I was a graduate student, which is longer ago than I want to admit. Um, I, I've sat in just countless conference sessions where rooms of scientists are, are stunned by the kinds of changes at the polls that, that are being documented, you know, in the field and, and with satellite data and so on. Um, it's, it's stunning how fast the Earth system is changing in response to our greenhouse gas emissions. Indeed. And Zita, uh, going back to the, the how we deal with disasters, in, in, with respect, it's easy to say, isn't it? That you know, let's bring in more early warning systems. Uh, let's nature do the work. But how does that work practically in in a situation like the floods in Pakistan, which are just so devastating? I mean, even if they were predicted, and, and they were, people saw the rains coming, but oh, probably not to the scale that they ended up being. But even if, if that is possible, there's nothing you can do when it's nature's acting in that way, that magnitude. 
Um, well, I think there's a range of different kind of uh, natural hazards. And if it comes to such a huge uh, event like the uh, monsoon uh, rain cause flooding in, in Pakistan, then of course the um, options to, to react are, are somewhat constrained, but even there, a lot can be done to, to reduce exposure and to, uh, to increase, increase capacities to deal with it. But most of the uh, hazards are actually not so extreme and uh, we are even uh, failing there to, to uh, decrease vulnerability and, and increase our capacity. So a lot can be done and um, what we try to communicate that we shouldn't give up and shouldn't say that we are anywhere, anywhere, anyway doomed and we can't do anything. Uh, that's just not an option. We can't accept that and we have to speed up uh, the action and also finance. Absolutely. Two more questions. So brief, briefly, if you would, uh, Sharon, first of all, we've got this no next uh, climate conference coming up in Egypt in November. Adaptation will be a, a big focus. Is there anything to you that suggests we can move forward on this one? I think now there is momentum growing and I think now we're starting to see the impact. So we've you know, just experienced a really prolonged um, heat wave across Europe and in the UK. These events will put climate change at the forefront of, of countries' priorities. Those heat waves will do us no harm when it comes to pressure at the negotiating table. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that change will start to happen now much more quickly. And, and Yara, what about you? And, and also, why aren't we acting faster? And it's pretty evident that, that this is soon going to put all of humanity's other problems into the shade. We're not acting faster in part because this is a very, a very tough problem to tackle. Um, but that's also a legacy of decades of misinformation campaigns that were targeted to do exactly that, to delay action. Um, I think we are now kind of on a personal level around the world, seeing the impacts of climate change so vividly that it, it feels much more real to people. And meanwhile, we have um, we have the technology and renewable energy is cost competitive now. We actually have the ability to start, um, I think, making much faster change happen. One thing I want to say as a parting thought, you know, this study shines a light on the damage we've already done, suggesting that um, we are committed to losing 3% of the Greenland ice sheet, which is a devastating thought. But the more important number is the other 97% of the ice sheet that we've not yet committed to losing. And, and so I really hope that um, people leave this discussion realizing that that other 97% is still there for us to decide the fate of. Um, and that's a lot of power that we have right now in this moment. Indeed, and the other problem that we have to overcome is, is how the consequences of all this are, are unimaginable to most people. A final thought to you, Zita. Yes, uh, also the IPCC um, sixth uh, assessment report says that uh, they are also more high-end scenarios like uh, going uh, uh, up to two meters until end of century. So uh, we really need to act now on both ends on mitigation, cutting emissions, but also uh, to adapt quicker and re reduce disaster risk. All right, we'll leave it there. Well, it is a very serious problem, and, uh, but there are solutions to it, of course, and I do hope that we've explored some of those uh, to a certain extent now. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Uh, thank you to our guests, Yero Axford, Zita Zebesvadi, and Sharon George. Thanks very much. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.